Hey, good evening, everybody. And, and by that, I mean good evening. It's it's Saturday night, and we're coming to you live from the Pleasant View, uh, sort of, so to speak. Uh, it normally would be our camp Sunday weekend this weekend, and so uh, we wanted to bring you a little bit of camp. And so what we're going to do is uh, the band is going to be coming to you from God's Glen, doing some music down there. And the video team said that it would make way more sense if they could uh, video it in such a way that you could see that it was a campfire. So they're going to be doing that at, at night, in the dark. I'm recording this a little bit ahead of time. So band's going to play a song, then you're going to have the message here, and then we'll go back to the band for another couple of songs after that. And so um, that's what's up. Anyways, all of that to say, we're glad you're here and enjoy a camp Sunday weekend on Saturday night. God, as we, as we take this time and we set it aside to honor you and to praise you, God, we just invite you to meet us here. God, you are worthy. You are holy. You are amazing beyond description. Lord, meet us here. Ten thousand reasons for 
to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. Greetings, everyone. Man, it's hard, hard to believe uh, that this is already the end of June and this would typically be Camp Sunday. Normally, we would be heading out to camp right after church and doing a bunch of activities out there and then, uh, you know, having a, some hangout time in the pool and then enjoying some burgers, some sausage singles and some sausage doubles. You know, it's always, they taste better when you talk like Sean Connery, I find. But um, that's not to be the case this year, and it's crazy to think that we're not going to be doing camp. However, with that in mind, what we thought we would do is we would bring you a little bit of camp. And so, as you've seen already, the band is out at God's Glen, and they're doing the music from there. So we've had a couple of songs. I'm going to speak now, and then we're going to go back out to them there, and they're going to do another couple of songs at the end. While we're thinking about camp, too, I also just want to remind you, let you know that... Um, Kenton and his team are working on doing a virtual online camp for everyone that registered for camp this year. What they're doing is they're doing videos that they'll send out every day of the camp that campers were registered in, and that will uh, give them an, act an opportunity to link into camp. Uh, there'll be um, some camp music that's going to be a part of the videos. The camp, some of the camp speakers are doing devotionals uh, for that, those videos, and there'll be some activities. So be praying about that uh, as we uh, start those virtual camp sessions, those camp weeks. And, and send those out to the campers. Uh, just be praying that the, the speakers would impact those lives as it goes right into the homes of the campers and that they would be able to engage with camp and, and stay connected with us through this way and that uh, then hopefully we'll be able to reconnect with them uh, out at Pleasant View next summer. Now, we've arrived at the last day, the end of our Jesus' Greatest Tweets series. And we're going to be finishing up the Sermon on the Mount uh, by looking at the last verses of chapter 7 this morning. And I really hope that you have found this series to be as maybe even half as beneficial as I have. It has been so good uh, for me as we've gone back and looked at the Sermon on the Mount in detail and as we've been challenged by what Jesus has been speaking about as we've worked our way through uh, that uh, message. For me, trying to engage with God uh, on these things that Jesus draws our attention to has been really good. It's uh, been helpful, again, for me to try and just, again, reconnect with that and to apply myself even more to what Jesus calls us to over the course of this sermon. And uh, as I've been trying to do that, it's been uh, great to have it affect my priorities and my perspective and um, my practices. And I hope that that's been the same for you. Now, I must admit that as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount and looked at things in specific sort of isolated uh, ways, you can lose track of the sermon as a whole overall. So this morning what I want to do is we're going to look at uh, the last verses, chap or verse, chapter 7, verses 24 to 29, and specifically even uh, more so chap uh, chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. Um, and then what after that, after we've drawn a few things out of those verses, then I want to just take a, an overall look at the, at the message again, the sermon as a whole, and try and, and uh, summarize it for us this morning. So if you would, um, turn with me to uh, chapter 7, uh, Matthew chapter 7, uh, 
verses 24 to 29, and uh, we'll pray, and then we'll dive in and look at it and go from there. So pray with me. Father, this morning, again, we thank you for this message that you've given us through your Son, Jesus Christ, uh, for the way that he has outlined for us a very great uh, picture of what uh, you require of us, who you are, what it means to enter the kingdom, kingdom of God. And so, Lord, as we, as we finish this up, I just pray that, again, that your word not, would not return to you void, that you would use it this morning to touch us, to change us, and that we would be that much more committed uh, to living for you, being obedient to you. And I ask these things now, all in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. All right, chapter 7, starting at verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the st streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation, it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he had taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. In these verses then, Jesus presents to his listeners then, and every bit as much to us today, one last warning. Specifically, he warns us against hearing his words, but then failing to put them into practice. It's a warning against intellectual knowledge versus belief and obedience. Those that hear his words and put them into practice, he says, is, are like a wise builder that builds his house on the solid foundation of rock. Those that hear his words, however, and do not put them into practice are like a foolish builder that builds his house on sand. As Jesus makes this comparison between building on rock and building on sand, Jesus tells us that the failure to do as he teaches is the difference between wisdom and foolishness. The wise man builds his house on the rock, but the fool Here's Jesus' words, and then builds his house on the sand. He goes on to live his life and do according as he pleases, not as God instructs. But we also see that it is a little bit more than that as we look at it a little bit more closely. It is not just a litmus test for wisdom uh, and foolishness, but it is also at its heart a question of yours and my obedience as his followers. And as we see at the end, obedience or disobedience ultimately tells the tale for us. Let's take a little bit closer look. Turn to verse 24. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, remember what Ryan was explaining last week. There he was saying that Jesus was talking about his true followers being those that do as he says. And in other words, it isn't good enough for us then to just say that we're followers of Jesus and then do our own thing, that that's not acceptable to God. So in verse 24, it carries on with therefore, or further to that, the one who does what I say is like a wise builder that builds his house on the rock. As Jesus refers to the rock, then he is referring to more than just physical rock. He is also referring to God. The Old Testament is littered with references to God as the rock or our rock. Psalm 75 verse 38 says, Then they remembered that God was their rock, and the Most High God was their deliverer. 2 Samuel 22, verse 32. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock besides our God? 
And Isaiah 26, verse 4, Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. So Jesus' re reference here to rock isn't just as a, a building material. He's referring to his Father, God. And we need to remember that as we look at these verses. In contrast, then, comes verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Now, I'm not much of a builder, but I have learned enough to know that the foundation is fundamental to the success of a structure. As the foundation goes, so goes the building itself. And if the foundation isn't good, then sooner or later, you're going to have a problem. And I've also learned that sand isn't sufficient as a foundation. It sinks. It shifts. It's not solid. So anyone that builds on sand is ultimately heading for disaster. So then, following from verse 24, where we see that the rock is God, then we should understand here that anything else that we build on is sand, or that sand represents anything else other than God. Now make note of something here. It's subtle, but it's very clear when we look at it carefully. Notice that there is nothing in between. We're either building on rock or we're building on sand. There's not a sliding scale of acceptable material, if you will, for your foundation. We either build on what is good and will work, the rock or God, or we're building on sand, which is ultimately going to fail. So Jesus is telling us straight up, there is no other acceptable foundation than God himself. If we are not building on him, then automatically we are building on sand and we're doomed to disaster. Our own accomplishments, the amazing things that we have done or said, as Ryan pointed out last week, are insufficient. And our efforts to be good enough are insufficient. They don't measure up. They don't amount to a solid foundation. It comes down to whether or not I do what Jesus says. Therefore, my obedience is essential. Last week, we saw it isn't enough to say I am a follower, follower of God. But here this week, we find it isn't enough to just know about him. We, if we don't do what Jesus says, then we aren't a part of God's kingdom. Now, John Stott and D.A. Carson articulate this much better than I can, so listen to them. John Stott says this, The truth on which Jesus is insisting in these final two paragraphs of the sermon is that neither an intellectual knowledge of him nor a verbal profession, though both are essential in themselves, can ever be a substitute for obedience. The question is not whether we say nice, polite, orthodox, enthusiastic things to or about Jesus, nor whether we hear his words, listening, studying, pondering, and memorizing until our minds are stuffed with his teaching, but whether we do what we say and do what we know. In other words, whether the Lordship of Jesus, which we profess, is one of of our life's major realities. This is not, of course, to teach that the way of salvation or the way to enter the kingdom of heaven is by good works of obedience, for the whole New Testament offers salvation only by the sheer grace of God through faith. What Jesus is stressing, however, is that those who truly hear the gospel and profess faith will always obey him expressing then their faith in their works. D.A. Carson echoes that. It is true, he says, of course, that no man enters the kingdom because of his obedience. But it is equally true that no man enters the kingdom who is not obedient. 
It is true that men are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, but it is equally true that God's grace in a man's life inevitably results in obedience. Now, one last thing from these verses. Note in verses 25 and 27 what identifies the legitimacy or the illegitimacy of our foundation is the storm. We should note a couple of things here. First, it isn't just a little squall. It is a serious storm that tests the structure of our lives right to our very foundation. From this, we should first of all anticipate there is coming a significant storm and it will also then reveal our foundation for what it is. Secondly, we should also note the results. The house built on the rock stands firm. That is then, those that do as Jesus tells us, come through the storm intact and we will stand. However, it is the opposite for the house built on sand. It comes down with a crash. So if we don't do as Jesus instructs, then there's a crash. And not just a crash, but a great crash. <clears throat> In the original language, it means that it comes to utter destruction, utter ruin. It's not something that can be repaired or patched up. It's devastated and it's lost. Now, here, Jesus might be referring in part to the storms that we encounter in life, because there are, at times, storms that can be significant in our lives and that can indicate to us the nature of the foundations of our lives. But there is also an eschatological overtone to the reference here of the storm. <clears throat> As Ryan pointed out last week, in Jesus' reference to that day in verse 22, he, it was an indication or he was referring to the coming time when he sets everything right and where he separates the sheep from the goats. Here too, the storm is an indication of the coming judgment of God. Note the parallels with Ezekiel where God speaks then of his judgment on the people and particularly the false prophets. Ezekiel 13 verses 10 to 14 say this, Because they led my people astray, saying, Peace, when there was no peace, and because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash, therefore tell those who cover it with whitewash that it is going to fall. Rain will come in torrents, and I will send hailstones hurtling down, and violent winds will burst forth. When the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where is the whitewash you covered it with? Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. In my wrath, I will unleash a violent wind, and in my anger, hailstones and torrents of rain will fall with destructive fury. I will tear down the wall you have covered with whitewash and will level it to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you will be destroyed in it and you will know that I am the Lord. So if the storms of our lives haven't already, the storm of his judgment will indeed one day reveal the truth of our foundation. Those that build on the true foundation of God by obeying him will stand firm. But those of us that build on anything else will suffer utter ruin. Now, as you're listening, you might be thinking, Doug, that sounds awfully harsh. But can I say this? If it is true, then it is awfully benevolent and kind of Jesus to let us know. At that point, what he has to say has to help us understand the whole of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus comes to us and gives us, first of all, at the very beginning of the message, 
a clue as to his identity as God. He goes on and says that this is the reality. Despite whatever you might think otherwise, and regardless of what the religious teachers have been telling you, this is the real deal. This is what is required of us to be a part of the kingdom of God. This is how you gain admittance to the kingdom. This is how you live as a part of the kingdom. And specifically then, as we go through the sermon, we find that God expects obedience from us that first of all revolutionizes our character as we see in chapter 5 verses 11 and 12. God expects of us obedience that initiates and motivates us to impact our world as we see in chapter 5 verses 13 and to 16. God expects obedience of us that moves us to higher levels of our righteousness as we find in chapter 5 verses 17 to 48. God expects obedience of us that refines our devotion to, to Him, to God, as we see in chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. God expects obedience of us that reprioritizes our ambitions and our focus in life, as we see in chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. God expects obedience of us that informs and impacts our relationships with one another, as we see in chapter 7 verses 1 to 12 and then God expects obedience of us that identifies us as unequivocal followers of Jesus as we've seen in chapter 7 verses 13 to 27 now you might be thinking to yourself Doug there's no way I can do that on my own and I can identify with that we can't do it on our own but just as God sent Jesus to tell us the real deal. He has also sent the Holy Spirit for those of us that will place our faith in God to help us begin to accomplish these requirements, these expectations of God as we seek to be obedient to Him. So don't let the significance of the task ahead dissuade you. The question that remains is, whether we're in or not. Let's pray. Father, today again, we stop and we say thank you for your word. Thank you for your efforts to communicate to us. And Lord, though this often sounds harsh, God, I pray that you would help us to see your benevolence in it. That you would help us to understand that you are just giving us the truth. That you are showing us the real deal so that we can know and understand and then make a decision. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make the decision to follow you, that we wouldn't dismiss this today, that we would turn to you, that we would build our lives on you as our foundation. And Lord, that then as we do that, that we have the expectation and understanding, the hope of being able to stand firm through the storms of this life and also then through the storm of your judgment one day. So to that end, God, I pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds now. For those that don't know you yet, that they would make that decision. For those of us that do know you, that we would recommit ourselves now to the teaching that you've given us here in this sermon. That we would be obedient to you, that we would be seeking and striving to live this out in our lives as you call us to. For we ask this now in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Now enjoy a little bit more music from God's Glen. We'll see you next week. John 4, 23 to 25. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Just as we're wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount series, and Jesus called us to a much higher standard. And it's about the inside. It's not how we look on the outside. It's about following Him in spirit and in truth and worshiping in all areas of our life.
search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you Sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it, but it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless worth. King of endless worth. No one. How much you deserve The one we can It's all I have is all Every single breath I'll bring you more than song For the song is not what There's a craze when the heart is on the fire. 
My dad left a 
Sunday this year, or this week. Um, <laughs> Let me, let me do that again. I'm just, that's bad. Hey, good evening, everyone. And good evening, everyone. I'll see you back here in a couple minutes. It's good until you said Sunday. Okay. <laughs> you really thought you'd bring you a little camp this Sunday. Yes, okay, darn. Take seven. <laughs> Don't think mistake is you're like, out there for a song. We got four songs. Four songs. Four songs. Do you want me to do it one more time? We're leaving it. We're leaving it. I want to go home. You're good. I'm, I'm with you on that.